When I was a kid, McDonald's was kind of a big deal. They were entering foreign markets all over the world, serving 68 million people per day. I mean, not that any of that was of particular interest to me as a kid, I could have cared less about corporate statistics, but what I did care about was the McDonald's brand. Because my memories of McDonald's aren't even necessarily associated with the restaurant. My best memories are of bonding with my grandparents over routine hotcakes and owning a VHS called McDonald's Treasure Island, which I watched over and over and over again. And I think that experience is similar to many of the other kids who grew up in the 80s and 90s. Because back then, McDonald's wasn't just food. It was fun. What we should be asking is how did it get that way? How did it ascend from the ranks of other fast food chains to become an experience? And I'll give away the answer right now. It's called marketing. And one of the most important concepts introduced was McDonald Land. Now, McDonald Land was an advertising campaign that began in the early 1970s. It featured a magical land inhabited by Ronald McDonald and a variety of other conspicuously food-based characters. And over the years, they were cemented into our pop culture, most notably the character Ronald McDonald. Well, okay, Ronald McDonald. Well, call me I, that. Well, it's your name. Which is as good a place as any to start. Welcome to the 1960s. McDonald's has no company-wide advertising strategy, leaving it up to the independent franchisees. Now, Ray Kroc saw sales explode after a Minneapolis McDonald's used radio advertisements. He encouraged the other franchisees to do the same. Now, shit really hit the fan when a Washington, D.C.-based McDonald's decided to target children and began sponsoring a local radio program called Bozo Circus. I mean, why children? Well, as Ray Kroc put it, a child who loves our TV commercials and brings her grandparents to McDonald's gives us two more customers. And children have always been some of the best consumers. They have disposable income, large purchasing influence, and are easily targeted with advertisements. Cheeseburger! Very good! Good. Here's a cheeseburger for you. You know McDonald's cheeseburgers are so delicious you almost have to smile. Anyways, when Bozo's Circus was cancelled, headliner Willard Scott was hired to create a new clown for local ads. And you'll never guess who that clown turned out to be. Introducing the world's newest, silliest, and hamburger eatingest clown, Ronald McDonald. Here I am, kid. Hey, isn't watching TV fun? Especially when you got delicious McDonald's hamburgers. So I guess it's important to note that this is 1963, a time when clowns symbolized childhood levity and not nightmarish terror, because, I mean, that looks less like Ronald McDonald and more like Norman Bates if he was a long-lost ringling brother. I know we're going to be friends, too, because I like to do everything boys and girls like to do. We'll have lots of fun. However, as Scott stated, there was something about the combination of hamburgers and bozo that was irresistible to kids. You sure can get a lot in these bags, can't you? Yeah, purely irresistible. And despite the connection between hamburgers and clowns being really feeble at best, it struck a chord and Ronnie D quickly became a sensation. They hired Coco the Clown to rebrand Ronald into the lovable character we know today, and a year later, McDonald's spent an unheard of $2.3 million on its first national advertising campaign. As Ray Kroc said, we're not in the hamburger business, we're in show business, and nothing speaks truer to that than McDonald Land. Created by Needham, Harper, and Steers, the advertising campaign began in early 1971. McDonald Land was portrayed as a magical place where plants and food and objects were beautiful sentient creatures, and the plots often involved villains trying to steal food only to be foiled by our lord, Ronald McDonald. Ronald! The Hamburglar took all the McDonald's cheeseburgers in town! Combining a mixture of puppetry and costume performers, the commercials were a huge success and continued to evolve throughout the 70s. I mean, Evil Grimace turned into Purple Poop Emoji Grimace, the Hamburglar stopped looking vaguely anti-Semitic and became more child-friendly, Everything was going great, except the whole thing was built on lies, stolen lies, and McDonald's was in the midst of getting their asses sued. Let me explain. This is Sid and Marty Croft. They were the creators of a children's show called H.R. Puff and Stuff. No, it's not about a weed-smoking deviant called Puff and Stuff, but about a shipwrecked boy named Jimmy. Needham, Harper, and Steers contacted them while vying for the McDonald's account. The advertising agency came to us and they asked us if they could create a McDonald's land concept a la Puff and Stuff. Eventually, the Crofts were told that the McDonald Land plan was going forward, and it was acknowledged in a letter that they needed to be paid for their contributions. However, soon after, they were informed the campaign had been cancelled. They stopped it and said that they were not going to do it. Which we all know is a lie, because we've already seen that trippy acid dream of a commercial. Get yourself ready for a trip through McDonald Land. This led to a series of legal battles starting in 1971, and eventually the pair successfully sued McDonald's, arguing the entire McDonald Land premise was copyright infringement. 
McDonald's was ordered to pay upwards of a million dollars when the case was settled in 1977. The judge stating, We do not believe that the ordinary, reasonable person, let alone a child viewing these works, will even notice that Puffin Stuff is wearing a cummerbund while Mary McGee's is wearing a diplomat sash. Which is frankly absurd. The idea that a cummerbund and a sash could be mistaken for each other is honestly offensive. I mean, obviously a sash is more decorative, worn as a broad belt or over the shoulder, while a cummerbund is broader and worn formally. A cummerbund should fit firmly around the waist. But that's besides the point. The outcome was that McDonald's had to cease using many of their characters and stop producing commercials in McDonaldland. The magical premise was all but phased out. Now you think that might have killed the idea. But this is McDonald's we're talking about, and McDonald's don't kill anything but chickens, cows, and the hopes and dreams of workers all over the world, baby. Do you think this is fair that I have to be making $8.25 when I've worked for McDonald's for 10 years? Let's move on to part three, McMerchandising. McDonaldland was as popular as ever. The introduction of the Happy Meal in 1979 was heavily promoted using the McDonaldland characters. Birdie the early bird joined the lineup soon after to represent new breakfast options. They introduced the Happy Meal Gang, the McNugget Buddies, and started merchandising everything. Everything! And people freaking loved it! The magazine McDonaldland Fun Times published six issues a year. Ronald and friends started their own Sega video game. There were action figures, play sets, and Ronald McDonald even won an award for his role in a big Hollywood movie show. Hi, Coach. How's it going? Sure, he won Worst New Star, but I honestly think time will look back fondly on his role in the contested masterpiece. Mac and me. They even teamed up with a production team behind Nickelodeon classics such as Rugrats and the Wild Thornberries to make a series of direct-to-video animated features. They were so popular that McDonald's consistently ran out of tapes. McDonaldland had reached its consumeristic crescendo. It had peaked to a feat of complete branding and merchandising reach, which meant that it was a matter of time before it was complete and the demise came in 2003. Conflict emerged between advertising agencies as to whether they should continue to use the McDonaldland characters or expand the I'm Loving It campaign. The latter option was chosen, and McDonaldland was burnt to the ground by boardroom suits. I mean, officially, the McDonald's position is that Mayor McCheese and his friends are indeed alive and well, enjoying life in McDonaldland, but we all know that's a lie. That's like when your parents tell you the family dog moved to a farm. Mayor McCheese and his friends are dead. Some of the characters have reappeared in recent years, though it's relegated to nothing more than cameos. You supposed to be a monster or an alien? Or whatever the fuck this is. Rubble, rubble, America. I am back. And I. Hi, honey. But McDonaldland was fun. McDonaldland was my childhood. McDonaldland taught us that children are the ideal consumers with great spending power and purchasing influence and a blank space in which to build brand loyalty. And if you can use merchandise and fun television show like antics to incorporate your brand into their self identity while they still generally view advertising as unbiased information before the age of seven, then you have created lifelong consumers. And that's a whole different type of magic. I believe in magic. I believe in you. I mean, with all that said, consumers will be consumers, McDonald's will be McDonald's. And whether it was an advertisement or entertainment, McDonaldland will always have a special place in my heart. You know, sometimes, dear, I think you like this place as much as the kids do. A place that can be used to manipulate me into buying McDonald's products, but a cherished spot in my consumerist heart. Now go buy yourself some McDonald's. You deserve it.